G'day, I'm Gavin, and welcome to Hurley's Fly Fishing in Southland, New Zealand. It's an amazing fishery that you've come to here, and one you're just going to love. There's an enormous range of rivers on offer, you know, from the Ariti just over our shoulder to uh, the Matara, which is world class. You've got the Wakaya, the Hamilton Burn, um, you head towards Tiana, you've got the Waiau, you've got um, Upakaroa. You've got literally everything on your doorstep here and miles and miles all up and down. You're going to have loads of opportunities. Some of these rivers hold lots and lots of fish, so don't be too alarmed if, you know, you spook one because it won't be too far upstream, you're gonna find another one. So uh, you've made the right choice in coming down to this area, you're simply gonna love it. Now it's very important that you do the right thing, you buy a license, and you can certainly do that just online, um, and you can buy for it from a day to uh, even a full year. And for the quality of the fishing, it's not that expensive. You know? What fish and game do really well is they've got angler access points. They have a queen's chain here on all these rivers. So, and that means 22 yards, which is the length of a cricket pitch, uh, from the, the uh, watermark uh, on each side of the bank you have access to. But you can only access from a public access point or an angler access point. You can't just jump a fence uh, as you wouldn't like somebody jumping through your backyard to get to your next door neighbour, you've got to access those, those points of the designated areas. Fish and Game uh, do these magnificent maps so uh, that show you all the anglers' access points. This one's on the, the Matawa River, but you can get them on the Ariti, all the different areas that you can fish, and it'll show you the roads and where you can get to the river uh, without doing um, any harm to trespassing laws. What we'll also do here, there's a really good etiquette, and that's because uh, there's so many fishing places and nowhere near as many fishermen as you're probably accustomed to in, in wherever you fish. What we do when we park our car, we put either a downstream or, or an upstream on our, uh, the front of our car. So when the next angler comes, he might see that you've gone upstream, so he can certainly park at that spot perhaps walk downstream and fish back up to that access point. And you're fishing water that nobody else has fished. So that's a much better way of doing it. Fish don't really like to be scared and then cast to again. It makes it much harder. So uh, certainly pay attention to the fishing etiquette that's in New Zealand. And there's a lot to read about once you do get your licence as well. And that'll give you some hints and tips. But uh, do the right thing and you're going to have a great day. Uh, when it's early season, the water's pretty chilled and you might get a bit of snow melt. Breathable waders are just a fantastic option um, because you will do lots of walking. You might be walking five or ten kilometres a day because generally you're going to want to be, be sighting fish, so you cover a lot of water. They're great. Um, but another option is to wet wade, and they do this by uh, wearing boots, but instead of the, the uh, neoprene boot foot on a, on a wader, fill it up with a wet wading sock, and that fills up that space uh, as well as giving you comfort. And you put together a pretty decent boot, uh, something that has to be rubber sole, uh, you cannot wear felt soles in New Zealand, and something with a good support and a nice grippy rubber sole as well. It's going to be fantastic to wear on these rivers, particularly when it's nice and warm and you're going to have a great day. Now the gear we tend to use is uh, a nine foot because we've got quite big open spaces, we're not um, fishing in tiny little streams that are overgrown. We're going to be fishing in big open areas most of the time. So he's a nine foot, and generally in the six weight, you can come across some pretty breezy days, and we need to be able to punch that fly into the wind. At times, we might have two tungstens, you know, under an indicator. So we need something with a good bit of punch with the long leader as well. And that breaks people's hearts. You know, we might have a nine foot leader, we might have six foot of tippet to our first fly, and then we might have like even like a nymph underneath that. That might go another, you know, like four feet. So you've got quite a length of line out there that we need to turn over. So I find like a nine foot six weight, something like the glide is ideal. It's got the punch to really kick through, but it's got that tip flex, which is pretty important, that looks after um, like tippets, but also turns that fly over, gives you a pretty good presentation. So something like that is ideal. At worst, a five weight is gonna be okay, as long as it's got a bit of power through it. The only time they become a little bit inadequate is when you've got a lot of, um, say, underground uh, tree roots and things like that, or log jams where you've got to stop those fish in a hurry. The five weights tend to flex a little bit too much and allow that fish to get his headway. So uh, I prefer a six on most times, but a five, 
if there's smaller fish around is certainly the way to go on a decent reel. Now we have to have like a dull coloured line. Anything other than, than dull just literally frightens buggery out of these fish before you know they even get to see you fly. So they're pretty wary, they're pretty big, they've been around for a while and they may well have had people fishing over in the last few days. So we've got to throw our flies and that be the first thing that they see. Not worried about you know bright coloured fly lines and that hitting. And that's important too on, on casting. We need our, our best cast to be number one or two. What we don't want is that fly line slapping on the water and then going, hang on, what's going on here? We want our best cast, one or two. They see you fly, eat it without any um, worry that there's something going on. And that's the best way. There will be fish at times where we've had 25 casts over and they get it. But most of the time, that's not going to happen. So try and get your best cast in one or two, and you're going to have a great day. Now, because we're catch and release, it's very important that we look after the fish. We use um, a cleans net, uh, which are much gentler on the fish. We always prefer to net them. That stops them from dragging onto rocks and bouncing around, which sort of can injure them uh, pretty severely. But then what's most important is that we keep them in the water for as long as we can. So what we'll have you do is once we've netted, we'll keep that net in the water and the fish in the water. Get that hook out, so get your cameras ready, whatever you've got to do. And then it's a short little thing. Bring that fish up out of the water, the photo, click, click, click and we release him relatively quickly. And we will do that by holding him upstream and we'll let that, uh, all the water go through the gills, oxygenate them again pretty quickly without spending too much time and that'll make sure that that fish is gonna swim off uh, and, and survive. And there'll be a good chance for somebody else to catch him another day. So um, certainly get your photo, but make sure we'll do it quickly and uh, care for the fish. Now I guess there's probably about five different seasons in, in Southland and the fish react differently at those times. We've got start of the season, so October, November, generally a lot more water around. Um, the fish are really comfortable, haven't been targeted too much, but you're mainly gonna get them on a lot of nibs. Um, there's not gonna be the real heat just yet to really drive the mayfly up. Um, at times there'll be a hatch or the evening rise and you'll certainly get them there, but most of the time the water's still going to be clear, you're going to spot them, but you've got to get them on your tungsten nymphs. So it's got to be flies and, and I think particularly in Southland, smaller is better. So you, all the, the fish you're going to catch are going to be on 16s and 18s, particularly when they're nymphs. And I know that sounds tiny, but that's what needs to happen. You might at times have a, a heavier fly to get a smaller one down there, or even an unweighted one. A, a, the, um, the rear fly uh, and that will bring the fish undone. But don't go too big with your flies because I'll certainly reject them. Once you get into your December time, that's a great time of year to be here. You've got a lot more heat and a lot more insect activity. So you can get a lot of hatches throughout the day and that's really great. Then you're gonna use like your Adam's parachutes. You've got your dad's favorite parachutes. I tend to love parachute flies, funny enough, because they just sit in the film really good. Um, what's also important is to remember that sort of spent spinner time as well. And we've got a fly called a Hubert's Red and also a Hubert's Grey because there's a, a few different um, mayfly species uh, coming out now. So you, colour's very important, but again, small. We're talking 16s, 18s, even down to 20s. When you get into your January, um, you can get a lot of in the... Um, the willow grubs, that's an incredible time of year to be here. And you literally have fish sitting behind a willow uh, tree just rising you know, every 10 seconds. And they can be a little bit frustrating unless you get the right fly. Nice little willow grub or even a sinking uh, grub as well as a floating um, certainly work. Or you can throw them something completely different like a blowfly and they'll eat that and you go, oh, well, pretty clever. But that's a great time of year because they're up on top. You generally get from your, your January uh, and into February as well can be a great time for cicadas. Uh, and that varies from, from year to year as to when they're gonna be out. But they, the fish, you can imagine for a feed like that, they'll go out of their way to eat it. So a nice big splat uh, next to them, they like to hear that plop. Uh, and they'll certainly turn and grab it. So cicadas are a terrific time in that time of year. The deer hair cicadas are great. Then we get into uh, March and April and uh, it's going a little bit chillier. The, the levels are quite low. Uh, you can get a little bit of mild rain, but it's an outstanding time for dry fly fishing. Uh, and it's certainly the later in the year, the better the hatches. And 
I, I guess we all love fish, whether it be on a dry or nymph or whatever, but once you can catch fish after fish on a dry fly walking up the river, well, that's pretty cool fun as well. Uh, and I also find, even though the season closes on most of the rivers in Southland at the end of April, we've also got May, which is a whole new fishery towards the lakes around uh, Tiano, which are, uh, they tend to be our rainbow waters. They're open for an extra month. But you do get fish that have moved right up out of the lake ready to spawn. A lot of browns, and there'll also be rainbows in amongst them as well. So rivers like Yupakaroa, um, the Waiau, uh, up to the Eglinton, and all the other ones throughout uh, Fjordland there are full of some amazing fish, so that's something worth targeting. So just when that season closes at the end of April, you don't have to rush straight home. Now with New Zealand relying on sight fishing, it's pretty important we have the best glasses we can get. I use tonics because I find they're the best in the world. They have the best glass lenses in a photochromatic, so they will change from light to dark depending on the situation you're at but in a, must be in a brown or a copper lens, and that tends to highlight the trout against all the rocks there. So you can spot that fish long before he spots you in a pair of glasses, they're gonna be fantastic. So wherever you're from in the world, they're gonna work really well here as well as at home, so take a pair of these with you. Now it can be a little bit daunting seeing all these different types of flies and some... Just ask Trevor behind the counter. He can let you know which fly is gonna work in what river at what time of year and it will certainly make a difference. But make sure you get the uh, as many as what you're gonna need because the last thing you wanna do is come across the fly that's gonna work on that river and you put the last one up in that tree. Now when it all gets too hard, this is what you're gonna make sure you've got in your fly box. I'd have a, a Hubert's Nymph, which is a little tungsten, there's 16s and 18s, great little mayfly impersonation. Something that would also um, work on a willow grub, something in that lovely in the uh, yellow or in the green. The blowfly is probably one of the best flies around for New Zealand. Into cicadas, once we start getting those um, in, into sort of like your, your January on February to your um, mayfly patterns and these are incredible and I would use those. You've got a dad's favourite in a parachute, your um, Adam's favourite in a parachute, that certainly works well all around the world and a Hubert's Red, again 16s and 18s and they're going to bring all these trout in Southland under. We've got a great little coffee machine there, Trev's Diner make you a, a lovely cappuccino or even a short little black. Good time to pass on a bit of information if he's got some time as well. But don't be afraid to uh, put a few of the things on the counter. You might be surprised at how much information comes out once you start buying some. Now, Didymo is like a, a weed that grows here and it literally overtakes the entire riverbed. Uh, it's not found in all the rivers, um, but it is on some that generally flow in and out of lakes. So you might have the, the Mararoa or Waiau, those sort of rivers. Uh, it's pretty thick at times. What we're mindful of, we need to clean our gear before we go and fish another river. So if you've fished in those rivers, um, you want to clean it and ideally even dry it before you go and fish in the tower or why out. So you're not transferring, because all it takes is literally one drop of untreated water to infiltrate those rivers as well. So try and clean your gear and get it as dry as possible before you start going and fishing different rivers. Uh, you don't want to be the one that's going to uh, transfer it from one place to another because it's not a nice thing uh, and we'd like to get rid of it. So um, try and do the right thing and uh, certainly look after New Zealand. Now as you're travelling around, this is a must have. This is the South Island Trout Fishing Guide by John Kent. It lists all the, uh, the fisheries in the entire island. Uh, there's also a separate book for the north uh, and it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. It'll tell you what flies to use, you know, the, what sort of fish are going to be, the access points. It's got all the information you're going to need while you're travelling around that island, which is all pretty good. If you want to fast track your learning, certainly get a guide. We do guiding in um, a variety of different ways, from a half day to a full day, uh, to even to an evening rise. So there's certainly ways that we can teach you there. Even if you're a beginner and you really just want to learn the basics and get out and have a go, we do those um, short little half day courses as well, so that's something that we can certainly help you with. Um, we're here for you, we've got the store which is literally full of everything you're ever going to need in New Zealand and we're here to help you. So uh, if you need anything just let us know um, and we'll certainly help. But if not, good luck, you're going to enjoy it over here, it's an incredible fishery. It really is the best in the world, uh, it's just full of the most amazing wild ground trout that you're ever going to come across. So I hope you enjoy yourself, have plenty of success. And I'm glad we can help you along the way. 
Now a huge part of our business is extended trips. We do a lot of trips to the west coast of New Zealand, which is an incredible fishery uh, that's literally untouched. Also into the North Island around Lake Rotorua. Some of the streams here you're casting at fish that are eight, 10, 12, 15 pounds, more than a, a, a rod length away. So it's an incredible place. We also go uh, like overseas to the UK, uh, Scotland, Iceland, incredible places um, that you can really expand your mind. And I guess that's what fly fishing is about, to give you these places to go to. And there's none better than going to Christmas Island, particularly in our winter, freezing cold. And you get over there and it's 28 degrees Celsius every day. You're walking along bonefish flats that are, you know, like six inches deep. And there was, you know, like six rugby ovals, you know, long and all you can see are bonefish tails poking up and you go, this is pretty cool. And you do that every day for seven days. You go, yeah, throw in a few uh, GTs, duck out and get some tuna, you got sailfish and you go, this is a pretty cool place. So if you want to go somewhere else, let us know because we're probably going there already.